not only because it's a, always a pleasure to talk to a group who's interested in the same things as I'm interested in, but it's also always nice to speak so close to home. As I'm sure all of you know, the professor of today is quite different than the professor of 10 years ago, and it seems to me that I spend most of my time on the road, and it's delightful to be back on campus. And actually, this traveling around is not always as, as pleasant as it might appear to be. In fact, just a week or two ago, a few weeks ago, I was in Washington. I landed late at night. I went into the Mayflower Hotel about 11 o'clock. I checked around the room. I didn't know what to do with myself. I happened to pick up the Gideon Bible, looked inside the cover, and it said, if you are weary, look on page 474. If you are lonely, look on page 622. I looked on page 474 and read what it had to say about being weary and was comforted. I looked on page 672 and read what it had to say about being lonely. But then at the bottom of the page it said in what was clearly feminine handwriting, if you're still lonely, call Axminster 54321. <laughs> and this and, and this And this, if I speak to a Republican crowd, I always say is the best advice I've gotten in Washington since the administration <laughs> changed. <laughs> well, tonight it is a, a pleasure to talk about the city's scarcest resource, land. And I'm not sure whether or not land is the city's scarcest resource, but as an economist, uh, there's some evidence to indicate that it might be. If you think about some of the things that have happened in recent years, some of the changes that have taken place is in the price level. It's always interesting to note that the price of houses in Los Angeles have increased in 10 years about 75 percent. The average family income in Los Angeles has gone up about 35, 37 percent in the last 10 years. But the price of land in many areas of Los Angeles has gone up a thousand percent. Land that you could buy in 1952 in Orange County for $3,000 an acre is now selling for about $30,000 an acre. And the only conclusion that I can derive from this startling statistic is that the demand forces for land must be far greater than the supply forces. And consequently, I come to the conclusion that land is becoming one of our really scarce resources, a resource that we must use with a great deal of care in the future. And this evening, I would like to direct my remarks around the f these questions of what are the demand forces on our land supply in Southern California, and what are the factors that we can do or the things that we can do to increase the supply of land in Southern California in order to handle this whole question of increasing land prices? Well, certainly the most important force causing an increase in the, in the use of land is people. And I'm sure that in this lecture series you've talked about the number of people coming to California, about the changes that are taking place in the population of our nation uh, a number of times. And everybody has various ways of showing this. Some of the Statistics that I like are the fact that every seven and a half seconds a baby is born in the United States. Every seven and a half seconds, it always makes me wonder when the work of the world gets done, as a matter of fact. If the birth rate that was established in 1940 continues, we'll have a billion people living in the United States in the year 2025. A billion people in 2025. Every month, we add a city the size of Phoenix to our population. Since 1950, we've increased the population of this country about Half the total population of Italy in the last 12 years has been the rate of increase. Not all Italians, of course, but an increase of this dimension <laughs> in about the last 10 years. So no matter how you look at it, we have a tremendous increase in the number of people that are living in this country. In addition to the great increase in people, just in terms of numbers, there's a great change in the distribution of the people in the sense of the age distribution. And this changing age distribution is having an effect on the way in which we're using some of our land resources. People are getting married younger nowadays. Do you realize that one out of every six girls that is 17 years of age in the United States today is married? One out of every four girls that is 18 years of age in the United States today is married. People are marrying younger, and these younger people seem to have a tendency to have large families. And they need larger homes. They need single-family homes rather than multiple dwelling units and consequently are, are demanding space of, of this nature. At the same time, why we have more people over the age of 65 in our country than we've ever had before. Uh, these people in turn are asking for different types of space than what uh, used to be demanded. And this is an interesting thing to think about because if we have more people under the age of 21 and more people over the age of 65, relatively speaking, we've got fewer people left in the working force than we ever had before. And I, for one, just parenthetically, am not particularly concerned about automation. In fact, I'm afraid automation may not come fast enough because unless we can produce more per man in the next 10 years, in 1970, we'll have a lower standard of living than we have today. So automation seems to me to be an important thing, particularly at this time in the 
age distribution of the population as we now have it. But finally, as far as population is concerned, and the thing that I think is significant for us is that since the 1940, the people of the United States have become mobile. They really move. We've had three great population movements since that time. One from the south to the north. I can recall reading a number of years ago an article in the Atlantic Monthly by an obscure junior senator from Massachusetts called Kennedy, which he was complaining bitterly about the south stealing the industry out of New England and the population with it, but now the statistics are out, the census results are out, and it's very apparent that the South has been losing its population. A lot of the population going out of the South, of course, is our members of minority groups, and they're going to New York, Chicago, Cleveland, and causing problems in those cities. But the net result is that the population is moving out of the South into the northern cities. The second great population movement, of course, has been the one from the East to the West, which I want to come back to in a moment. And the third has been the one from the farm to the city. Since 1950, depending upon which statistics you use, and one must always be careful with statistics, I suppose, but since 1950, about 90% of the population increase in this nation has taken place in our cities. And today, in the metropolitan areas of the United States, there are almost as many people living in, the, in all our metropolitan areas as lived in the entire nation in 1930. By no stretch of the imagination are we any longer a rural country. The only people that think so, I think, are the congressmen from Nebraska, North Dakota, and places of that sort. We're a great urban nation in our, uh, in as far as the distribution of our population is concerned. And yet, we have a great cultural lag about this matter. As a matter of fact, in Washington today, we have a great Department of Agriculture. We spend a lot of money in research on problems about the farm and all of the uh, land-grant college areas. We have campuses of universities directed to doing nothing but research on the farm problem, but we don't have any universities that are dedicated to doing nothing but research on the city. And even in Washington, we don't have great expenditures for research on problems of the city. Ernest Fisher, a very well-known urban land economist, always loves to say that in the United States last year, there was more money spent for research on the peanut than there was spent for research on the problems of our city. And this is essentially true. Last year, we probably spent more money in the United States to store wheat not to buy it, but to store wheat than we spend on all our programs of urban redevelopment. So we have somewhat of a cultural lag as far as considering the problems of our city. We even have it in our educational system. We have the youngsters come to school in the fall after they harvest the crops and they get home in the spring in time to sow the seeds. We operate on the old agricultural system even there. So we have had this great migration then of people from the farms to the cities. The other migratory movement, of course, is the one from the east to the west, which I alluded to a moment ago. Everybody knows, except Governor Rockefeller of New York, that California is now the largest state in the nation. <laughs> and we have been growing at a fantastic rate. Los Angeles and Orange counties alone, between 1950 and 1960, increased their population more than any state in the nation between 1950 and 1960, in just this metropolitan area. Every day, 1,700 people come into the state of California. Every day, 1,100 people come into Southern California. So we have these two great migratory movements, the one from the farm to the city, the one from the east to the west, all kind of, uh, coming together here in Southern California and in Los Angeles, which must mean, as Professor Bell pointed out to you last week, that someday in the not too distant future, we're going to have a great me megalopolis or megapolis or whatever you want to call it, stretching from Ventura to San Diego. And how are we going to accommodate all the people when they come into, into this area this way? And, of course, there's the related question, will they still continue to come? What is the future as far as population growth is concerned? And it's really difficult to, to even contemplate, I think, the, the great amount of population change that's going to occur in this area. I'm always reminded when I think about it, the story of two men who met one evening. They were chatting, and one said, you know, I had the most interesting dream last night. I dreamt I was a little boy again. My mother was taking me to Pacific Ocean Park and to Marine Land and Disneyland. I was having a wonderful time. And other fellow said, well, gee, that's interesting, because I had a dream last night, too. I dreamt I was in Las Vegas, and I played the slot machines, and I won. I played the roulette wheel, and I won. I was walking through the lobby, and I met a beautiful girl just like Jane Mansfield. I thought this was going to be a magnificent weekend, but then I met another beautiful girl just like Jane Russell, and I didn't know what to do. The first fellow said, well, why didn't you give me a phone call? And the second man said, I did, but your mother said you're at Disneyland. <laughs> uh, I, I, I tell this story. I tell this story because... <laughs> Because when talking about the future of population growth in Southern California, it's really difficult to know when you're talking about dreams and when you're talking about reality. 
I'd be very surprised if anybody in this room could have stood at the corner of Mulholland Drive and Beverly Glen in 1940 and looked down into the San Fernando Valley when there were 30,000 people there and said that in 1962 there'd be a million people living in the San Fernando Valley. And I suspect it's equally difficult tonight in 1962 to say with any degree of real certainty how many people there are going to be in Southern California in 1982. But my guess is there's going to be an awful lot of them and that the population trends that have started, the movements that have started, I see nothing to reverse them. Indeed, as long as we have uh, prosperity in the nation and better than average prosperity in Southern California, the people are going to pour into this region. One of the few truisms of economics is that population always moves from those areas of low economic activity to areas of high. And with the sort of industries that are probably going to develop in Southern California, the electronics and so on and so forth, which are, are the high wage industries, it's very likely that the people are going to continue to move into this area in a very big way. The thing that could mitigate against it, of course, is that it may just become so intolerable to live here that nobody will want to come. And this is not a, an unimportant factor. And indeed, today, in industrial location work, one of the major factors that a factory looks at, that an indu industry looks at when they decide to go into a region, is whether or not the people are going to like to live there. Because today, as I mentioned earlier, the labor force is mobile, they'll move, and unless it's an attractive place to live, they don't want to be in that location. And I'm always sort of impressed by the fact that Santa Barbara every day has industrialists knocking at the door wanting to build a plant there, and they won't let them in. And just 100 miles away in Bakersfield, they spend 25, I hope there's nobody here from Bakersfield, 25 or $30,000, $50,000 a year trying to get industry to come. They want to go to Santa Barbara, but they won't go to Bakersfield no matter how much Bakersfield spends. Why? Because it's so much more attractive to live in Santa Barbara. And the location in terms of, of industrial plants today is very much in terms of how well will the labor force be satisfied. And indeed, if our place, our area, Los Angeles, gets so congested, it may well be that we'll have an automatic break in our population growth. But it's hard to say for sure whether or not this is likely to happen. My, my general belief is that there will be a great number more people coming to Southern California and that we're going to have to accommodate them some way. And the way we do accommodate them is terribly important because the way we build houses for them, we build industry, industrial plants, commercial centers, and so on, the way we use our land determines the way in which our city is going to grow. And indeed, this is much broader than an economic question. This is a political question, a social pr question, a sociological question because the way in which we use our land creates the sort of city that we're going to have. And it's very important that in the next 10 or 15 years we look at our land resources and we use it intelligently and efficiently. Well, how do we use land now? What are the ways in which land is utilized? Well, first, I suppose, in the Southern California area, quite a bit of land is still used for agriculture production. Some of you may, have re may recall that on the recent propositions, Proposition 4 was, a ballot, was on the ballot so that there would be special tax advantage given to agricultural land. That is, any land that was used in agriculture purposes completely would be given a special tax, a special assessment, and would not pay as much taxes as, as, uh, as if it were assessed for its highest and best use. This proposition, fortunately, was defeated, and so consequently, land that is now being used for agriculture purposes in this area will be taxed in terms of its highest and best use. I say fortunately it was defeated because I, I don't believe that uh, agriculture in the middle of a metropolitan area is really a very very significant use for a piece of land, that the land ought to be used in some other way. And as long as it was given special tax advantage, there was no reason for the owners of this land to bring the land back onto the market. And so I'm glad that, that it was defeated. Uh, I think this is a great myth we labor under, saving that land for agricultural purposes. There's no shortage of agricultural production. The only shortage is places to store the products that we subsidize so outrageously. <laughs> The technological operations are such that every year we produce more on smaller and smaller amounts of land. And indeed, while we've been transferring in California about 70,000 acres of land a year out of agricultural use into urban use, we still are producing more agricultural products than we've ever had produced before. And also, if you look at the land that can be brought in by, uh, my, uh, by irrigation, we have enough land supply to handle all the agricultural production we need in California for at least 60 years. So I can't get terribly concerned about the loss of land from agriculture uses to urban uses. Now it is sometimes suggested that it's unfortunate that if our children grow up, grow up without ever seeing a cow or a pig or something of this sort, and that we should keep this land for sort of open space. 
But there are a lot more effective ways of doing it than just leaving it in agriculture production. Obviously, we need lots of land for open space and then for parks, but this may not be the specifically the same land that the farmers uh, would like to have taxed in a very advantageous way from the point of view of the farmers. So I don't worry a bit about the loss of land for agricultural uses. The second way in which we use land, and most important way in which we use land, of course, is for residential purposes. And in Southern California, we have been the land of the single family home. We developed the tract house here in 1946, and I suspect that most school teachers throughout the United States dream of the day they can move to California and have a small house with an orange tree in the backyard. This has been the traditional idea. Come to California and have your same, have a home of your own. And indeed, I for one am, am not ashamed of the tract house. I think the tract house and the houses that have been built in the suburbs is one of the, one of the really great contributions in American society today. We now have in the United States about 60% of the people in their own homes. In 1930, about 30%. And a lot of the innovations, the new ideas as far as construction of houses came out of California and came out of the tract house. There are many reasons why we had the tract house. Good financing right after the war. Uh, imaginative builders, uh, things of this sort. But certainly one of the things that was terribly important is that we had relatively cheap land. A subdivider who wanted to build a tract of housing in 1946 could go out and buy all the land he wanted for $3,000 an acre. And by subdividing it, he was able to put houses on that could sell for people, to people who were in the lower income groups. And now we have to realize that the median income of people in Southern California is $7,200 a year. That is, half have over $7,200 and half have less than $7,200. This means that these people ought to be paying $17,500 to $20,000 for houses if they're going to live in single family homes. But when the subdivider goes out to buy land to build houses, he finds that he has to pay $25,000 or $30,000 an acre for this land if he wants to build it in the form of a single if he wants to develop it. He can get four lots out of this. That means $7,500 a lot before the improvements, $2,500 a lot for improvements, $10,000 in the lot before he even can start to build the house. And so the question I raised, does this mean with these land prices that the single family home is gone, is doomed as far as Southern California is concerned, living in this particular area? The builder will tell you that perhaps it is, unless he can find some new ways of financing land. You talk to a builder and he says, if I pay $30,000 an acre for land, I have to build apartments because this is the only way in which I can get the value of my property out. Uh, he calculates the fact that uh, his income is so much higher on apartments that this is the way in which the land necessarily has to, be, has to be developed. I keep pointing out to him if he has 15 stories of empty apartments, it won't make the land very valuable. Uh, but at the same time, this is the way many of them think. And the fact of the matter is that apartment building is going in a very, very big way right now. Do you realize in 1957, for the first time in history, there were as many units built in multiples in Southern California as single family units, uh, pardon me, in Los Angeles. In 1957, for the first time in history, as many units in multiples as many in, as in singles. This year, there are two units in multiples for every single family unit that's being built in Los Angeles County. Two multiples for every single family. And in the 14 Southern California counties, which include an awful lot of open space, there are as many units built in multiples as there are single family units this year for the first time in history. So we are, in fact, changing to a multiple type of construction in, in uh, Southern California at the present time. And one of the interesting things about this, that even with the great increase in multiple construction, we haven't had a, a very phenomenal increase in vacancies. In fact, in many areas, the vacancy rate is still substantially low. Now, this must mean, then, that the people are willing to move into multiple housing units, are willing to live in them. And this, is, this indeed, is, is what is happening. What we don't really know for sure, though, is whether people are going to be willing to live in the high-rise apartments in Southern California. We haven't had too much experience in building high-rise multiples. Uh, we have Barrington Plaza, which is 1,700, uh, pardon me, 700 units down on Wilshire Boulevard. And we have a few other high-rise apartments that have been built uh, along Wilshire Boulevard in various places. We have 1,900 units planned for Pacific Ocean Park, factory uh, uh, developments of this sort, but we really don't know. This, I always think, is one of the great real estate investment experiments in Southern California, because we really don't know whether the people out here will, in fact, live in these high-rises. The only high-rise pattern that we had after 1946 was Park La Brea, which was right behind uh, the Prudential buildings, and these apartments were empty for years, as you know. They used to leave the lights on at night, but few people were fooled. They were vacant. 
And the fact is that people didn't want to live in those areas uh, for some time. Now they're full. And it may well be that there's a changing change in tastes and preferences so that people will be willing to move into high rise. And if indeed our land prices remain the way in which they are or continue to rise, it may well be that the pattern in Southern California will be a pattern of high-rise development of apartments, and this is where the newcomers in Southern California will have to live. And if this happens, this means that Los Angeles, instead of becoming the prototype of the city of the, tw of the uh, city of the 21st century, will in fact not be moving in a unique direction of, as a type of city, but rather will be becoming more and more like the eastern cities, like New York, like Chicago, and Philadelphia. And it may well be that this is the pattern that's underway at the present time. If we can't find some ways of financing land for developers, and by this I mean of either taking the land out of the mortgage and putting it in a lease arrangement or something of that sort, it may be very difficult to maintain Southern California as the land of the single-family home dweller. It's very impo important that a lot of thought be given to this question, I think, because there is some great advantages of developing a city around the single-family home rather than around the apartment house. Well, the third way in which we've used our land, in which we continue to use our land, of course, is for commercial operations. Here again, the developments in Southern California have been amazing during the last uh, 15 or 20 years. As all of you know, while the shopping center, the regional shopping center, has become the pattern of development for commercial purposes in California, the old string-type development is no longer with us. People just simply don't want to shop in places where they can't find parking. And so, consequently, the shopping center has been developed to a high degree. There have been 25 department stores built in Southern California since the end of World War II, and only one of them have been built in what you might call the older section of the city. And the phenomena of the shopping center, of course, is not hard to explain. The, the merchants merely followed the people out to the suburbs, and they provided them with things that they couldn't get anywhere else. Better parking, uh, uh, better facilities, better stores, everything of this sort which people wanted. Also, the fact that incomes are as high as they are at the present time, I think, have helped the shopping centers a great deal. In the old days when people would go downtown to save a dollar have long since passed. The convenience is much more important, and so consequently the shopping centers have done very well. And there's little likelihood that this trend will be reversed, that commercial developments will continue to be important uh, in the outlying regions. But then the question rises, if this is true, what happens to the central business district? What happens to the downtown area? Is it doomed? Uh, to, uh, to fall into disrepair and decay? Well, I think not in terms of many of the things that it can do. The central business district will always be important as an administrative cent center, as a finance center, as a civic center. Los Angeles needs a lot of help as far as the civic center is concerned. But as retail trade is concerned, it probably means that the central business district stays are done. But the retail trade, certainly in the Southern California region, will more and more be in the outlying regions rather than in the, in the central business district. This is sad for the city of Los Angeles in one respect because uh, central business districts always give vitality and excitement to their cities. And unless you have a very vital central business district, it's sometimes difficult to get this excitement going. Los Angeles always often has been described as 75 small towns looking for a city. And it's likely that the commercial developments as they're going are going to increase this trend away from L.A. as a great metropolitan area into more and more smaller communities. Well, the fourth way in which land is used, of course, is for industrial purposes. This is perhaps changing more rapidly than almost any other way in, in the city of today. The new architectural styles in our cities, the new ways in our industrial plants, the new designs are making it possible to locate industrial plants in close conjunction with residential areas and commercial areas, which never could be done before. Clean factories are, are a thing of, the, uh, thing of the present, not a thing of the future. And there's really no reason to isolate these factories away into separate sections of the community. It doesn't have to be done anymore. There's a lot of advantage of this uh, because if you can design and plan efficiently so that you can integrate your factories close to the place where people are going to work, you eliminate the journey to work, you eliminate a lot of the trips, it makes an awful lot more attractive place to live. The amount of industrial development that comes into a community is terribly important because this, in, an, in a sense, determines how much your city is going to grow. We developed an index back about 1957 of manufacturing employment changes in major California cities, and we could predict with a high degree of certainty just from changes in manufacturing employment 
precisely what the changes in population were going to be in a particular area. We predicted in, in 1958 that San Francisco would show a loss of population in the census of 60. You could predict the San Jose population explosion. You could predict LA and San Diego, all on the basis of what happened to manufacturing employment. So if you want to control the rate of growth of your community, what you need to do is control how much manufacturing you're going to let come in. A few years ago, when I was doing a little bit of uh, work with Governor Brown's Commission on Metropolitan Problems, a commission that has since gone out of existence but prepared a very attractive brochure, uh, this, one of the things that I suggested might be done was to develop a differential tax rate in the state of California for in industry, so that if an industry would go to Sacramento or would go to San Bernardino or someplace like that, they'd get a better tax situation than if they come to Los Angeles. But the simple reason would be that if they went there, the people would go there, and places like Sacramento and San Bernardino can absorb people less expensively than we can absorb them to the Los Angeles region. Obviously, this idea didn't get anywhere, uh, and so nothing of this sort has been done. But I think that in the next 10 years, with the population growth of the dimensions that we're expecting, we will have to give a lot of thought about where our industry is located. Because unless we can disperse the industry throughout the state, we're going to have a continued congestion into our, our most crowded areas. And one of the controls that we need to exercise if we want to do some long-range planning and, and have some control over city growth is to look at where the industrial development is going to take place. Well, finally, land, of course, is used for recreational and uh, public purposes. It's imperative that we try to hold land for proper recreational needs. I think the Professional Golfers Association says that we should have a golf course for every 40,000 people. We only have one for every 80,000 people in Southern California. I consider this a serious loss. Uh, but not only golf, but in all types of operations. It's most difficult to hold land for recreational purposes. Uh, when you go out to get land for residential or for commercial or for industrial, there's always someone that has a great vested interest in it. But nobody seems to have really a vested interest in holding parkland unless it's Robert Moses in protecting uh, Central Park in the city of New York. Uh, but other than this, why well, it's, it's very difficult, unless you have someone who is really excited about it, to hold land for recreational purposes. And yet this is going to be a great need in the future. Well, how do you uh, increase the supply of land? If we're going to have these great pressures on land, how do we get more land? Well, one way of which we effectively increase the supply of land, of course, is to use it more intensively. And this is what we have indeed done in the last five years. We've used our land much more intensively in Southern California by building a high-rise apartment. We put many, many more people on an acre of land this way than we do in the single-family home. But when we do solve our problem this way, of course, we're creating a different type of city. We're creating a city where the uh, single-family home no longer prevails, it has some advantages to have people in apartments, but it also has some uh, disadvantages. The second way, of course, that we can increase the supply of land is just to use some of the land that's lying around much more effectively. And we're seeing this happening in Southern California a great deal. All you have to do is look out your window and you see the mountains that you thought would never be developed now being built with uh, lots or subdivided into lots. And indeed, the development of new earth-moving equipment has been so phenomenal in the last few years that I suspect it's going to be possible to develop all of, all of, all of the Santa Monica Mountains and all the mountains in this area. Uh, in the next few years, and I think they will be developed. Occasionally, I'm on a program with Mrs. Valley Knutson, who's chairman of the Los Angeles City Beautiful Movement, and she practically faints whenever I say this because they like to maintain the greenery of the hills and so on, but I think it's inevitable that these hills will be developed. Uh, the pressures are going to be so great that this land will be taken out of its virgin state and put into some sort of development. I suspect that 10 or 15 years from now, we'll have high-rise apartments lining Mulholland Drive from one end to the other. Uh, in that particular area. A third way in which we can increase the supply of land, of course, is to bring the land closer in. Now, what I mean by this, of course, is that land gets its value from its location. Uh, this is what makes land valuable and useful, is the, its location in relation to economic activities. There's no scarcity of land in the United States. Every time you get on a plane, while well, you see nothing but empty space all the way from San Bernardino to the Missouri River. Uh, so there's no scarcity of land. In fact, everybody in the United States could live in view of the Pacific Ocean, and we'd still have a lower density of population than we have at than there is at the present time in Belgium. So there's lots of land. The question, though, is to make this land useful. And one way, of course, you make it useful is by increasing and improving your transportation systems. And the 
essential thing here is time. How long does it take to go from one place to another? We apparently in Southern California have put our, our bets on improving the transportation system through the freeway system. And I think we probably have done really a very, very good job. In fact, you can go through central Los Angeles faster than you can go through any metropolitan area of the United States at the present time. And, the, and when the freeway system is finished, we'll probably do a, uh, much better than we do right now. But still, there are problems. And certainly the problems are immense in certain of the freeways, like the Hollywood Freeway. I once asked a friend of mine in the engineering department how many cars go in the Hollywood Freeway, and he said they really didn't know, that they didn't have an electronic device that was good enough to be able to measure this with any high degree of certainty, but that they had a rough index based on the death rate. It wasn't too accurate, but <laughs> gave them a reasonable idea of, of what was going on. You couldn't imagine, you couldn't imagine the development of Orange County, for example, the way in which it has developed if we didn't have the Santa Ana and San Bernardino freeways. It would be incredible that they would have developed the way they had. It's probable that the completion of the Ventura freeways had a big impact on the development of the west end of the San Fernando Valley. So the freeways, I think, have, have really done a great job in bringing more land into use. We don't have in Southern California, of course, a rapid transit system of any sort. We've had a lot of talk about it. We've had talk about rapid transit ever since about 1914. I've often thought that if we'd spent the money to build a rapid transit that we spent to study it, we'd have a pretty good system operating now in su certain sections of the city. But it's highly unlikely, it seems to me, that rapid transit will come to Southern California for a long time population is simply not, not dense enough. And I'm not referring here to anything, anything in terms of its mental capacity, but <laughs> the number of people that are living uh, per acre or per block is not sufficient enough to support uh, a mass transit. They tell the story of uh, Chicago, and I don't know whether it's apocryphal or not, that they did a study there of the rapid transit system, and they found out that it would be cheaper to let everybody ride in the transit system for nothing than it was to charge them fares, because by the time they paid conductors, printed the tickets, and made the change and so on, it was more expensive than if everybody had ra r rode on the system for free. And in Chicago, they do have the densest population in the world, no matter how you figure it out. So it would seem to me that, <laughs> it would seem to me, it would seem to me that uh, rapid transit is a long ways away as far as Southern California is concerned, that the freeway will continue to be the way in which we move people, in which we try to bring more land into effective use. And indeed, I think the freeway will probably do a reasonably good job for it. We're committed to the automobile in Southern California, for better or for worse. Uh, as former Governor Knight used to like to say, everybody could go for a drive on a Sunday afternoon and nobody in Southern California would have to sit in the back seat. And uh, this really is a good description of how many automobiles there, there are. It obviously wasn't a good campaign slogan, but it worked out pretty well as, <laughs> as far as describing this situation. So we bring more land into effective use by improving our transportation system. And finally, one way in which we get more land to try to answer the need is to redevelop some of the land which we have, which is not being used effectively. You know, when you build a city 50 years ago or 75 years ago, you may put an improvement on a piece of land that seems right at that time and would be right at that time, which is no longer effective or no longer proper. We see this, say, in Bunker Hill. 1900, Bunker Hill was one of the finest places to live in Southern California. Today, it's made up of a lot of worn-out properties. It's run down. It doesn't have the tax base that it ought to have. This land ought to be changed. It ought to be put into higher and better use. And so we have developed in the, this, this nation a program whereby land of this sort can be brought back into higher and better use under what is known as the Housing Act of 1949. Now, in most instances, land is changed. The use of land is changed by a, uh, economic forces in and by themselves. I often think that Hollywood, the residential area of Hollywood, is probably one of the biggest private redevelopment sections in the, in the world because all the single-family homes in that area have been torn down and replaced by apartment houses. No government money, no subsidies. It's just the operations of the market uh, independently. But sometimes the market doesn't operate that way. And if it doesn't operate freely, then you may have to move in and do something about it. Now, this title, this Housing Act of 49, 49 which is designed to help clear land, was really a, uh, a bipartisan act, if there ever was one. It was passed by Senator Taft, Elner, and Wagner. And I often think Senator Taft, who wrote the Taft-Hartley Act, getting together with Senator Wagner, who wrote the National Labor Relations Act, was a miracle in and by itself. Nothing could be more bipartisan. And under the Title I of the Housing Act of 49, every community is given the right to appoint a local uh, redevelopment agency, which is usually made up of, of lay people who serve without pay constantly they serve, 
uh, without pay. And they do a survey of the community to find out those areas which seem to be run down, which seem to be somewhat slum-like, and which need to be cleared out and redeveloped. If the area meets certain standards, why the community agency will, with the, its staff, go mm -hmm. in, buy the, buy the land, move the people, tear the houses down, and offer the land for sale to the highest private bidder. Mm -hmm. This sounds very easy, but it's been going on for 13 years on Bunker Hill, and the land isn't offered for sale as yet. And you can see the, the reasons are, are for this are, are not hard to find. People hate to sell their property. A lot of people have lived in Bunker Hill for 40, 50 years. They don't want to move. Even though you explain them it's for the better, for the welfare of the community, they, they still don't want to move. And so you run into an awful lot of problems of clearance of one sort or another. But this is just part of it, because when you get the land cleared and you offer it for sale, you usually find that nobody will pay you as much for the land as it's cost you to buy it and clear it. There's always a deficit involved. Now, under the Housing Act of 49, this deficit is paid for two-thirds by the federal government and one-third by the local, uh, by the city. The city, in turn, is expected to get its money back, and it does in the city of Los Angeles, in the state of California, by issuing tax revenue bonds, which mean that any increase in taxes that are collected from the area are paid to retire the bonds before the money goes into the general fund. You think about Bunker Hill for a second. The tax revenues off that area are reasonably low right now. But if it's redeveloped as it's planned, it will be with 25, 25-story buildings uh, with several thousand high-rise apartments there, high-rise apartment units, uh, the tax increases will be phenomenal. And this will put this uh, land back in the tax roll and should be able to, uh, to uh, pay off the bonds without any problems. Actually, we need urban redevelopment programs to bring older sections of cities back into use when we have such pressure on land. In Santa Monica, they've got one going in Pacific Ocean Park, which everybody supported in Santa Monica, more or less, except the chief of police. And the chief of police was opposed to it because he said, now, when a crime is committed in Santa Monica, he always knows where to go to arrest the person that's guilty <laughs> down the Pacific Ocean Park area. But with the redevelopment, they'll be dispersed throughout the community. It'll be harder to find them. <laughs> so he has not been too keen on it. But the fact of the matter is the project's going ahead. They're going to build. The contract's been let to the Dell Webb country, uh, Company to build 1,900 units in Santa Monica. These will be high-rise apartments just opposite the Pacific Ocean Park area there. It really will be a tremendously beautiful development. I think it will be very much, I suppose, like a Rio. It will be one of the prime locations as far as living is concerned in Southern California in that particular area. But unfortunately, as much as we need these redevelopment projects, I really don't think the legislation is working the way in which it should in the nation at the present time. And just exactly how to get it back on its feet is hard to know. One of the problems is that a lot of the land is cleared, and then it's offered for sale, and nobody wants to buy it. So the only conclusion you can come to is that the highest and best use of this land before it was cleared was in slums, and it should have been left that way, probably. I think it's a mistake to confuse urban redevelopment and public housing and things of this sort. You shouldn't clear the land under, under urban redevelopment unless there's somebody who wants to buy it and use it for a higher and better use. But a lot of land is empty. It's sitting around empty because it's been cleared with no buyers coming forth. So we need to do a more careful analysis, I think, of what are the alternative uses for a good deal of this land. The second thing that is wrong is that, or that is difficult, is that local public agencies do have eminent domain. And, you know, to go in and take a person's house and uh, condemn it, tear it down, force these people to move, and then to turn around and sell the land to a private developer to put a private improvement on it for private profit really seems to me to have some problems in it. Uh, and having sat through many public hearings on the issue, I know that there are, people feel very strongly about this particular issue. How to solve it, I'm not sure whether it's some sort of a participation program or not, but it seems to me that this is something we need to look at. There needs to be a lot more thinking about the way in which to make urban redevelopment programs operate. They're essential, they're necessary. We see them in Manhattan and in Chicago and in Philadelphia and some of the si older cities more than here. But certainly this is going to be one way in which to get more land, and one thing that we're going to have to do is to get these programs work effectively. Well, the final way in which we can increase our supply of land is, as the demand keeps increasing is to plan our land uses more, more intelligently, to use the land that we have more efficiently and more effectively. This is easy to say, but it sometimes is very hard to do. I think that we zone a lot of our land excessively here. For example, you got in the San Fernando Valley, and you'll find in many sections of the valley that the land was zoned in half-acre building lots. 
There's nothing really wrong with half-acre building lots, but if you like to do on Sunday afternoons what I like to do occasionally, namely go out and look at houses that are for sale without telling the realtor your name, uh, <laughs> you'll notice as you look in the backyards of many of these half-acre lots that you can just see the history of this house, that the year it was bought, they loved the big property. Uh, the next year they moved the back fence in 100 feet, the next year another 100 feet, the next year another 100 feet, and so now they've got a very small space which is covered by the swimming pool and a small uh, tomato plot or something of this particular sort. The rest of the land is all grown up in weeds and you know that land is gone forever. It can never be developed, you can't get into it, there's nothing you can do about it, it's just lost. And I think we have a tendency to overzone some of our residential properties, even our setbacks. Setbacks are always nice on streets, they look lovely, but really isn't very useful. And we ought to be more careful about the way in which we zone land so that we don't waste it. We also waste an awful lot of our land in streets. 25% of the land in the city of Los Angeles is under pavement. And most of our streets really don't move much traffic. And I think we need to have some more imagination about the way in which we lay out our subdivisions. I'm sure all of you have heard of the Radburn development in New Jersey, which instead of having a street running down between two rows of houses why you plant this as a park you bring your cars in behind you build your houses around sort of a parkway instead of around a street it makes a lot of sense most of our streets don't really move much traffic at all and uh, how much nicer it would be if you had some sort of a public park or some sort of a mutually owned park in front of your house instead of a street it certainly would be better for the picture windows which seem to be necessary uh, in practically all houses now, even though they do nothing but look into other picture windows. <laughs> so the seems to me that we have some things that we can do as far as our imagination is concerned in, in layout and design. I often think of even commercially how much more we can do in our planning. Take Hollywood Boulevard. Hollywood Boulevard can be aptly described as the longest, slowest moving parking lot in America. You get, in, <laughs> you get on one end and as time goes by you get off the other. And I often think what we have missed in terms of a great opportunity for planning and development on Hollywood Boulevard. It's probably the most famous street in the world. Certainly Hollywood and Vine must be one of the most famous corners in the world. Uh, people who come here would like to go and see Hollywood and Vine once, and that's enough. We ought to be able to uh, do something up there. How much better it would be if Hollywood Boulevard were torn up, turned into an outdoor uh, park with beer gardens and so on and so forth. And this would revitalize that area commercially and certainly would make it much more attractively attractive for the people that live in the general area. The same thing with our downtown region. I often wonder about our freeway systems that are designed to pour cars into the downtown area and then have no place for them to park. Uh, how much better it would be if we surrounded the downtown region with parking lots and then developed some sort of moving sidewalks to move the people into the central section and planted the downtown section into parks uh, all the way through. Somebody then all immediately tells me it would all be just exactly like Pershing Square, and this gives you great pause for thought about the development uh, <laughs> under these circumstances. But if we did that in downtown L.A., if we did that in downtown L.A., it would make it an attractive place to go. And everybody that came to Southern California would want to go two places. They'd want to go to Disneyland and downtown just to see what it was like. We need more imagination in our planning. We need to use our land more, more attractively. Uh, if we're going to be able to solve the problems that we're going to come up in the next uh, in the next few years. And land planning is where this imagination has to come. It's where we must get this excitement. But in looking ahead, of course, at these problems, at these uh, changes that could come about, we mustn't forget some of the problems that stick with us in the past. I suspe suspect all of you were probably as shocked as I was a few years ago in looking in Time magazine when you read for one of the managing editors of the Chicago paper, it must have been The Sun, I think, I was surprised when one of his reporters phoned in at night that uh, a baby had been eaten to death as it lay in its crib by rats that night. Uh, he was so shocked that he decided to send a team of reporters out to look at the housing conditions in the city of Chicago. And when they came back, they wrote a series of articles called The Shame of Our Cities, uh, which won a Pulitzer Prize. And the things that they had in these articles were uh, stories of a little boy who played in the street who was known as Pigface because when he was a baby, a rat had bitten off his nose. Uh, families that lived in what they thought were coal bins who were afla afraid to blow out the candles at night because when they did, the rats attacked them. And this was in Chicago in 1959. Not in Shanghai in 1859 or in Glasgow in 1859, but in Chicago in 1959. And I suspect there are people living that way in Chicago tonight. And this is just an intolerable situation in any nation that can produce $550 billion worth of goods and services a year. And in our excitement of looking ahead at the future, 
how we're going to improve the city. We mustn't neglect these problems of the past. And we've got a tremendous challenge, it seems to me, in every city and anyone interested in the city in trying to make improvements in the, in the housing conditions of those people who are not fortunate enough to house themselves satisfactorily. However, tonight we are looking at the city of the future, and it's terribly important, it seems to me, that all of you who are so interested in the city make a special effort to be concerned and, and knowledgeable about what the planning departments are doing in your city. Now, I know for sure that if you see us, uh, there's an announcement sent to you at your house that a freeway is going to cut through your lawn, that you'll be down there protesting right away. Uh, and this is what usually happens. Most people are terribly concerned about what happens in their same area and in their private properties, and of course this is not hard to, do, hard to be interested in. It's more difficult to get people terribly excited about general problems. I, I remember two battles I led and lost, which seems to be my fate. Uh, one, when the polo field, which some of you may remember, on Sunset Boulevard was taken out. This would have been a great park. Sunset Boulevard was overcrowded with traffic at that time, and yet uh, the land was taken over and made into a uh, subdivision. Uh, the, no the motel at the corner of Sepulveda and Sunset. Maybe this is a great place for a motel if you don't live right there. Uh, but it seems to me that we must take an interest in the city as a unity rather than just the city as specific uh, enterprises and specific things. You know, it's not very hard to, uh, to make a lot of money and you can always lose it the day before you die, but if you really work hard to make a better city, if you work hard with your city departments, uh, you're building a monument that can never be taken away from you. It's a hard fight, but it's a fight that people like you have to lead. It won't be done by the Boy Scouts or the Girl Guides. I'm always impressed in talking to a group like this, and I always think of the statement that was made by Daniel Burnham, who was a very great architect uh, when he was talking about the city almost 50 years ago to a group of graduating architects at George Washington University. He t said to these young men that as they were going out and thinking about the city, something like this. He said, make no little plans. They have no imagination to stir men's blood and probably won't be realized anyway. Make big plans. Aim high in your hopes and your dreams, remembering that our sons and grandsons are going to do things we never thought of. Let your watchword be order and your beacon truth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Gillies, for a very uh, eloquent and very uh, interesting and effective discussion of the city and land. I couldn't help feeling a twinge as I heard uh, Professor Gillies speak of the uh, Santa Monica's re response to urban redevelopment. Uh, I, have to, I happen to be on the side of the police chief in this matter, and I have appeared before the city council and spoken my piece, although I don't live in Ocean Park, and therefore I feel that this is a, a somewhat uh, a detached uh, uh, interest and concern, because I'm uh, what apprehensive about what seemed to me the, the point that he touched on, referred to Professor Gillies in speaking about this problem, uh, the question of whether people should properly be uprooted from their homes and places that they are attached to, and the land turned over for private uh, use or private development. But this is, as uh, he has suggested, a, a very uh, complicated problem. And I'm probably over-persuaded by my, uh, what I uh, speak of as the Smith Law, that everything new is worse. And I, <laughs> I, I don't know that this law is... <laughs> I don't know that it doesn't have, uh, you know, exceptions, but I do think that the point that he made, uh, Professor Gillies made very eloquently at the end of his talk, is that if there are to be exceptions, you all are the ones who will have to make them, because uh, many people have criticized Los Angeles and continue to do so because of just the fact that growth takes place in an unplanned and, and chaotic fashion. Uh, as we have in other of our sessions, uh, we will open the floor to questions, and you may just uh, address them directly to Professor Gillies. Here's a man already. Yes, sir. That's a very good question. Uh, 
And I really can't answer it, because we really don't know yet, uh, after 13 years. Uh, the original plan calls for high-rise construction. As you probably know, high-rise construction now is so expensive that when you come down to making the rentals come out, why, it's very difficult to rent anything less than $150, $160 a month. Now, if you consider that for middle-income groups, there will be some. A very distinguished architect by the name of Yo Ming Pei and his associates are just finishing up a plan for Bunker Hill, and we'll know more about it in a couple of weeks when this plan is, is out. So I, I really can't specifically answer your question. Yes, sir? Are you in favor of birth control? <laughs> you, mean, you, mean, you mean personally or philosophically? <laughs> In a more general sense. <laughs> I haven't given any thought to this question, as a matter, as a matter of fact, in a very general sense. Uh, I, I, I really don't have any answer to that question. Sir, uh, is it true that the uh, Department of Land in California uh, no longer uh, does the land grants to people in the state? Uh, it's very difficult to get land through the state and the Department of Lands, but if you want to get free land, you get it through the federal uh, land drawings that they have in the state of California. Every now and then they'll announce that a certain amount of land, the federally owned land, will be put open to anybody that wants to get it. You send your name in on a postcard, they draw it out of a, out of a uh, hat or something, and they let you know where it is, and if you put an improvement on it within a year and then pay a modest amount, well, you can keep it. Now, uh, my only suggestion to you is that if your name is ever drawn, just, you know, uh, pay it and never go to see it, because if you go to see it, you'll be so discouraged you won't want it. Uh, it's always so far out in the desert, and it's very, very little good land is, is left in these ways, these drawings. Yes, sir? In the near future. You have, no, uh, you have no hope for mass transportation. I really don't think we'll have a, have a very, what I would call a total mass transportation system in this area in a long, long time, if ever. Now, we may have a spine run down Wilshire Boulevard, as they've talked about, of mass transit of one sort and another in the next five or ten years. But uh, even this, the amount of subsidy that's going to be involved is so great but I, uh, I don't believe we'll get much rapid transit of a uh, comparable, say, to that of, sh of New York or uh, Boston, of New York or, or uh, Paris or London. And I really don't think we'll ever see it in this city. Uh, the way the land is grabbed up for private development, isn't there a need for some drastic legislation to save it for recreational and educational purposes? Well. That's an awfully good like question. I think that it's very important that every planning area and every every region ought to take advantage of every bit of legislation that they now have. For example, under the Housing Act of the, the last session of Congress, why their money was provided to cities whereby they could acquire land, open land, and hold it for recreational purposes. But you have to have a, a vital, and I'm not drawing any invidious comparisons here, but you have to have a vital, dynamic uh, local government that will go after these programs and will make them operate in, a, in an effective and efficient way. I think that there are ways in which we can hold land under the present laws uh, if we uh, use all the resources that are now open to us. Very expensive to do, though. We must weigh how much recreation means to us in these areas because uh, land uh, is, is truly one of our very valuable resources. Yes, sir. You suggested that we need a good deal more imagination in uh, our uh, city uh, planning. I, I think that if we wait for the same developers who built the San Fernando Valley to start using imagination, it will be sometime long after the second coming of Christ. <laughs> and if we wait for the uh, city and county planning bodies in our, in our city government to do the same thing, it will be somewhat longer. Do you have any concrete suggestions on what the route is to arriving at more imaginative uh, planning of the kind that you suggest? I think that there's lots of things that can be done for this. I think that uh, the FHA program, for example, instead of just 
uh, being the sort of program that the builder can come in, build his houses, and walk away. If they would give special consideration to builders who come in with uh, particular plans meeting certain land use standards would be one way. Even bonuses. I think if the federal government wants to subsidize land use in certain cities that instead of putting so much money into urban redevelopment, perhaps, that they put some of these resources into private developers who do come up with holding land in open use. I think that cities might give differential tax treatment to developers and to landholders in areas where the land is uh, given an open space so that you're providing park space without cost to the city. Uh, there are a lot of these things that could be done. Uh, but they will only get them done when people insist that they be done. As long as we're satisfied with the way in which our Developments take place. Why uh, this will never take? We'll never get anything done. Uh, we have an archaic, I think, without question, archaic city charter that we operate under. I'm always impressed by the fact that the City Council of Los Angeles, by charter, must meet every day. Must meet more often than the Congress of the United States. And while uh, our problems are complex, I don't think they're that complex. We need an aroused citizenry like I said, on some of these issues. We really do. I've often thought, just on this a little bit. Uh, We've never had in the city of Los Angeles in my short time here any person or group of persons who've been excited about the city as such. Uh, I'm thinking here, I, I use the obvious parallel of a man like Robert Moses in the city of New York. Now, most people that have worked with Robert Moses in the city of New York, I think, dislike him intensely. I don't know this for sure, but I, I've heard this. But still, he always is fighting about something around there to make this a more attractive and more significant city. And you don't pick up the Los Angeles Times or the Herald Examiner in the city in this city, and every day see something on the front page about tearing down City Hall or doing this or doing that, uh, which at least would make you think about the problems of our city. Mm -hmm. And what we really need some way is to find a, a way to galvanize a gal uh, all the different forces that we have going here to make this a great city. I really think this is the greatest place in the world to live for an individual. You can find the finest housing accommodation as in uh, any metropolitan area in the United States. But in terms of, a, of the excitement of a city, which you feel automatically when you go into Lincoln Center, New York, or places like that, we don't, we don't seem to have generated that yet. And the great challenge, I think, for the administration of the city of Los Angeles is to bring that excitement into our city by uh, uh, imaginative planning and things of these, this, this sort. Yes, sir. For the last two years, the Home Magazine has been running a uh, running campaign for uh, revision of the tax uh, structure Well, they, they're almost, uh, they have been running this campaign, and shades of Henry George come down every time you, you look at it in a way. It's not exactly a single tax system, but they have argued that the tremendous increase in land values that have occurred in the post-war period, many of them are not the result of anything that have been done by any developers or any landowners. It's just fortuitous that the great increase in land values have come about because people have moved into an area, and therefore all people should benefit, and therefore the taxes in these, this land ought to be higher. We ought to tax away some of this, what they might call unearned increment, and uh, use these resources to plan our cities more effectively. I think there's something that can be said to the argument, but you, you can't carry it too far to extremes, because if you make holding land uh, completely unattractive, you may not get people to go in and buy it and develop it one way or another. But there's, there's a lot of advantages in having a tax system that will lead to land being developed very rapidly and not held for speculative purposes. They're very persuasive, I, I agree. Yes. There's someone, I'm particularly sensitive to questions asked on the right hand side of the house because I was <laughs> accused after one lecture of being a leftist because, I'm <laughs> <laughs> because the speaker had only recognized people on the left hand side of the house. And while this was a very engaging, this relation of a relation to spatial uh, dimension of the left wing, uh, <laughs> the here might otherwise have been lost. This seems to me to be associated with the birth control question <laughs> in some way. I think that to the extent that you can integrate some of your different uses, why you, you have great advantages. Think, for example, what the Jans are doing in Caneo Valley and Thousand Oaks is tremendously attractive. They went out there to this property, which is out the west end of the valley, the same family, by the way, which built Westwood Village a number of years ago. Uh, they had the foresight to buy the land in Caneo at 50 cents an acre back in 1913. But at any rate, why they're going out there, and the first thing they did was build an industrial tract on which they got industry in there. 
And then when the industry was there, they built the houses for the people that were living in that general area. Then they built a commercial center. Now they have a saving and loan. They have a, uh, a radio station coming in, I understand, a newspaper. And I suppose this is sort of a bedroom community, but what it really is is an integrated community so that these people that live out there, they don't have to travel long distances to work. So I think that the integrated community is, has some advantages over the bedroom community. Uh, are you referring as a bedroom community to just an area completely separated from your industrial developments and so on? That's a, a lot of people consider the San Fernando Valley as the bedroom of the city of Los Angeles, for example. I think the more that you can integrate with modern architecture, your different types of land uses, the better off you are for, this, for two reasons. The basic one being that you eliminate the trip. But if a man can get up in the morning and wander across a park and go to work, how much better off he is. I'm always uh, amused by the fact that we spent years and years to get social legislation for the 40-hour week and then we add two hours onto each end of every day to <laughs> get going to and from work. And with a little thoughtful planning, we might be able to eliminate a lot of this sort of thing, and I think this might be better. I think it was like, you know, the tax base for the Well, the, if you develop your community around this way, why then you have serious problems as far as the taxes are concerned, and this is why I favor some sort of a regional tax system, so that you would appro appropriate your taxes in the various ways as they're needed. I yes, mentioned that you thought the freeway system would be able to be able to handle the um, traffic problem in the future. Well, well I, was I that bold? I said I hoped it would. Well, anyway, you, you, you said that you don't think a rapid transit system would be successful. But today, many of our freeways at the peak traffic hours are jammed. So how can we get around this problem? Well, they're getting better, though. And when the freeway system is finished, uh, the traffic engineers tell me that they, uh, the jamming will be a lot less. You can go from downtown Los Angeles to the valley faster now than you could two years ago, even though the number of people that are in the area because of the new bypass on the uh, up Bakersfield and Golden State and so on and so forth. And it is a fact. Uh, I just saw a report that you can move through the city of Los Angeles faster than almost any major city in the United States at the present time. Now, the freeway system isn't completely finished. Uh, when it is finished, why, it's hopeful, and the, uh, some of the most imaginative planning, by the way, is being done by the Los under the Los Angeles uh, Division of Highway, the Division of Highways office in Los Angeles, about how many freeways will be needed to move these people. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say to me they always love to see a bus in the freeway because it's somebody else not driving a car. Uh, this is often true. We, we might like to see rapid transit if we didn't have to take it ourselves. Uh, I think that we're wedded to the car in L.A. and that people want the car and that we ought to design for the automobile because we've got it, even our, our subdivisions and things. Not think of it as, a, as an evil, but something that we have to learn to live with and, and uh, integrate it into our planning and development. Uh, I think there's a lady back here. Well, I think, that I think some would. I think there's no question some would, and I think it might be helpful. My feeling is that the cost of constructing it and the degree of subsidy that would be involved would be so great to make it go that we would be unwilling to pay this price at the present time. Sure. I think perhaps this is a good time to call a halt to the formal question period, and if some of you have particular questions that you haven't had an opportunity to address to Professor Gillies, I'm sure he'll be glad to linger a few moments to uh, answer them. Thank you very much for coming. Let me remind you uh, that uh, we are having next week the 7th, this was the 6th, the 7th of our lecture in our series on the city uh, in, and modern man, Professor Leo Grebler speaking on the new face of European cities. We've been quite uh, parochial or quite uh, egocentric in our concern with cities since we've concentrated most of our attention on American cities and the particular problems uh, that they face. So we'll broaden our perspective next week with the uh, help of Professor Grepp. Thank you very much.